so let's, we're going to move into um, locating the right link code. And uh, in all of this, the link term name is your key. All right, so we're going to spend some time diving into the link uh, term name and what it means and how it defines actually the essential uniqueness of each link term. Uh, so we call a link term a fully specified name because it, uh, it is intended to include the information necessary to distinguish among clinically important differences. And so back when we started uh, Link, the structure of how this name was, uh, was created was informed empirically uh, over time and iteration Muted. attributes that distinguish among the things that we want to distinguish from and keep together the things that we want to aggregate together. So overall, uh, the Link term is broken down into six major axes. And we're going to walk through each one, but let me just give an example so you can sort of show how this works. So um, not part of the term name uh, is the code itself. Uh, but I just brought it up here for illustration. So the code is a um, unique identifier. Technically, it's a string because it has a little dash in it. The format of it is number dash check digit. The check digit is automatically created based on a formula that is um, computing uh, the, the first uh, couple of digits. Um, the link code is uh, not completed if it does not have the dash and the check digit. So that is the unique identifier. Put that in your message. Don't drop off the, the uh, dash uh, piece of it. Um, there is nothing um, inherently inferable about a link code from looking at it other than you can tell something about its age <laughs> because they're just assigned in order. <laughs> so, uh, so the bigger the number, the more recently it was created. But apart from that, you know nothing. Uh, it doesn't, it's, it's not positional. It's not lab terms get some set of codes and clinical get others. It's totally sort of meaningless. Um, uh, so that's, that's the link code itself. Now the name is broken down as these C's, these six uh, major axes, the component, the property, timing, system, scale, and method. And of these six, the method is the only one that is optional, meaning it is not a required entry for creating uh, the term or the term name itself. Uh, and we'll get into uh, methods and, and why we would add it in some cases and not others uh, when, we, when we talk about the method access. But there's six of them. Um, method is, is optional. Uh, it's important to think about what's not part of the link name as well. So those are the six, the big six, the key six. What's not part of the test name? Um, well, basically the take home message is anything that's not essential for uniquely identifying this observation, um, which would include things that are carried in other parts of the HL7 message. Um, things like the reason for the test, the disease it diagnoses, the actual instrument that the testing is performed on, really specific details about the specimen source, the priority, whether this is ordered a stat or routine, where the testing was done, who did the test. Um, basically, recall sort of lunch role is to fit in that spot of identifying what the observation is. Anything that's not essential for that, um, that role, we tend not to put in the, the link name itself. So um, let's go through uh, the key parts of the link name. The component. The component uh, is, you can think of it as a general structure. It's the substance or entity that is measured, evaluated, or observed. And so in a lot of cases, this is a substance or um, a, uh, a antibody or antigen or it's a name of a, a particular kind of measurement. It is the thing that is being evaluated uh, or observed. There is a substructure to the component which has two optional pieces. So every length term is going to have something in that first slot that is the analyte. Um, the analyte or the, the main thing that's being observed or not. There are two, um, and actually a secret uh, a couple of other ones that we won't talk about, but there are two other parts that are sometimes used. Uh, one is the, uh, the challenge, and the other is any adjustments. Um, there's, I don't know, there's less than 20 or 30 codes that have adjustments, I don't know, so we can almost ignore that. But there are a couple of uh, terms that have adjustments that are made, for example, 
to the patient's actual body temperature. It's important for recalibrating sort of the the, the challenges you muted more frequently, and it has a, a substructure within it uh, that is organized by having uh, the first part being a time delay, um, then a post, and then the challenge type. And for example, in glucose tolerance tests, you might phrase it something like, you know, one hour post, 100 grams of glucose per hour to pee out. So that little structure can be used to identify challenges which affect um, the, uh, the measurement of the analyte. But uh, the analyte itself was kind of the formal analyte name. We specify any sub-analytes that we talk about, um, antigens, antibodies. And we can identify subclasses if the, the, the measurement of the test is focused on a particular subgroup or subclass of the, um, the analyte itself. So ionized calcium uh, as one example of a subclass. So these two optional pieces are separated in the formal name itself by those hats, the carrots. Um, if you see no hats, what you've got is the analyte. Uh, that's, that's there. So component is the first part of the name. Property is um, the second part, which is a little bit trickier. Uh, we'll, we'll spend some time going through some examples of properties because it um, uh, can be a challenging one. It's an area where I see a lot of um, trip-ups or slip-ups in mapping uh, is uh, not paying attention or not sort of properly deciphering what the property is. Um, so what is property? What's this all about? It's the, it's the characteristic or attribute of the analyte that's measured, evaluated, or observed. It has its origins in um, the, uh, the IUPAC Silver Book, um, the sort of metrologic uh, sort of thing, uh, kind of properties. And it starts by thinking about, okay, if I have an analyte, what can I measure? I can measure the mass of that thing. I can measure the, uh, the molar amount of that thing. I can measure uh, catalytic activity. I can just count it. Um, there are lots of different sort of categories of things uh, that I could um, observe about Those are reflected. We take kind of those broad categories and we reflect them as fully named properties like this. So you can have a mass concentration or a substance concentration. Uh, you can have catalytic concentrations or mass content. Uh, and we're going to get into some of these sort of specifics uh, in a minute. But those are some of the sort of sort of physical quantities uh, that you can you can measure, and they're reflected, of course. Muted. Familiar with they're reflected or related uh, to the units of measure. So a mass concentration, right, is anything that has a mass per a volume, uh, and so that's going to be reflected in your reporting units of something like uh, milligrams per deciliter. Now, one, the one code that has mass concentration is not saying the only allowed units are milligrams per deciliter or whatever. It's saying that's anything that's valid which has a mass over a volume is acceptable uh, and it fits it. So it's like a level of abstraction above units uh, in some ways. Um, but properties are basically never in local test names. <laughs> so in order to figure out which one is which, you're going to have to look at the units of measure uh, in order to sort of pick that out. Which property do I have? You're going to have to look at units of measure, which is why they're sort of one of the essential, uh, the essential things. Um, there are other kinds of properties that are less um, sort of physically based. So when we call um, an impression or an overall interpretation, that's a kind of property. When we're doing categorizations, you might call it um, a type. When you're, what you're saying is it's a kind of this or kind of that. Um, so uh, these are some examples of properties. And the, the, the goal here is to sort of separate out things um, based on uh, these, these attributes that you're measuring. So, uh, big caution, you want to pay attention to property. Uh, don't just ignore it. Um, you want to pay attention, and we'll go through some examples of this. So basically, if you have a quantitative measurement, you've got to pay attention to your units and choose a line code that corresponds uh, with a relevant property. Um, the timing is the, the next attribute of the long-term name, and this is um, uh, essentially a, uh, the interval of time over which the observation or measurement period was made. And so by far and away, the most common one is just point in time. Uh, and I forget, I don't know, 80% of long terms are PT, something like that. Um, the vast majority of it, maybe it might even be higher than that. Uh, but for periods where you have um, 
say, uh, collections, urine collections or something over a period of time, uh, there's uh, a way to represent 12-hour, 24-hour collections in the long-term name, and you're going to want to pay attention to those. One of the things to uh, think about or, or um, observe when you're choosing between long-term names is if your timing is not PT, you're often going to have some kind of a rate uh, as your property uh, because you're doing something over a period of time. I'm counting something over some duration, and that corresponds to a rate uh, property. So there's, uh, there, it's a signal there in the timing attribute as well. The system is the, the context or specimen type upon which the observation uh, was made. So typically, um, you know, in the lab context, you're used to thinking about things uh, measured on serum or serum plasma, specimen or whole blood or urine, uh, tissue. And uh, when you start running searches in LOINC, you'll see uh, terms that come up with have this funny XXX uh, in the system. And uh, you think maybe it was like redacted or something like that. It was too explicit. We couldn't say what it really was. Um, that's not true. Um, we'll talk about this as our somewhat unfortunate naming convention more later, um, but essentially XXX in the long-term name means that the specimen, the system, is uh, unknown uh, or specified elsewhere. So basically there's a convention in, um, in HL7 where you can put specimen information in other segments. Um, there are places where uh, you don't know or you know what you're saying in some other place. And this is sort of a lumpy designation for extracting out that information from the long-term name itself. We'll talk, we'll talk more about XXX uh, specifically in a second, but that's what its role is in the long-term name. Um, there's also a substructure to be aware of in the system that includes this hat uh, designation, and then following that is something we call the super system. And this is designed to handle contexts where there's an observation being made on a specimen um, that is something other than the patient whose record it's being stored in. So by default, when you see no hat behind your system, just assume it's patient. That's sort of like the default, the vast majority of everything. When you measure serum, we're sort of saying, yeah, it's the patient serum, and that's whose record it's going to be stored in. So we have cases where you're measuring something on a blood product unit or a fetus or donor and that information is going back and being stored in a particular patient's record. It might be the recipient or the mother or whatever um, of that information. And so this kind of helps address that situation to know that what I'm measuring is not a measurement directly on that patient. It's on this other thing, which we call the super system. So you'll see those um, in LOINC, those are the hat, and then the thing following, um, uh, following that is called the, uh, the super system. The scale is uh, the next attribute uh, we're going to talk about, and this is where one distinguishes between observations of different, uh, different types. So it distinguishes between quantitative from categorical uh, result values in some ways. So um, the scale could be QN for quantitative, which essentially in Moink's view is something that's a continuous numeric, and that, that does include things that have operators, so greater than or less than is still counted in our view as, as, uh, as QN, um, but that's distinguished from things like ordinal. So an ordinal uh, is a, a, a basically a set of responses that you can, for an order, you can rank. Um, so 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, mild, moderate, severe, positive, negative, all of those things, uh, reactive, non-reactive, all those things have a order to them. Uh, and are flagged as such um, in the database, and so those are distinguished between those and, and quantitative, which is also different from uh, things that are nominal. So nominal is a categorical variable where the responses are not rankable. It's from an unranked taxonomy or an unranked collection. Um, you know, you could think of them um, like uh, sort of numbers on a football jersey. They're numbers, but they're, it, you, there's no inherent order to them, really. Um, so bacteria names uh, or um, uh, location types or um, anything that is inherently unrankable gets that categorization of nominal. Uh, NAIR is the scale that represents um, narrative free-form text. I mean, essentially it could be um, 
uh, multiple sentences, paragraphs uh, of, uh, of text. Um, and uh, you'll find these in lots of, uh, in lots of places. Um, and there's sort of a, a progression between a migration that's sort of happened in some categories where we previously called some things NAIR, but now we're using a slightly different convention uh, called DOC, which is um, generically meant to capture things that are information collections. So easy example, right, a discharge summary is a collection of information. There's an explicit set of stuff that you would expect to find, but it's not defined by enumerated elements like a, a panel would be. It's a collection. Um, it doesn't necessarily enforce or imply a particular technology. So CDA or PDF or whatever, those things can all take different shapes and there could be more or less levels of enumerated discrete elements inside of a document. Um, that's not the point of having this as a scale. The point is just to sort of say that it is a, a, um, a collection um, of information. So these are helpful. And again, this is where um, whether or not they're in your test name itself, Loink is going to have a different code for things that are uh, categorical in nature from things that are um, strictly numeric in nature. Um, the last attribute is the method. So method is, uh, again, specified where uh, only where it's needed. So needed if the interpretation, the clinical interpretation of the results is different. So the idea is to not go crazy in detail with methods, um, but to list them really as types or category, categories of methods to fulfill the purpose of things that you don't necessarily want to plot together, you don't want to aggregate together. They may have very different normal ranges, very different test sensitivities. You need some distinguishing characteristic on the, on the technique, um, but not at uh, an overly precise level of granularity. So this is obviously a little bit of a fine line uh, and there's sort of an ongoing sort of discussion and evolution on some kinds of methods, some places where we should be more specific, some places where we should lump more stuff together, but the idea is um, to use it where um, the overall interpretation is going to be affected and none of those other attributes make the mark uh, as far as that distinction goes. So Cindy likes to say so. Make a comment here. Okay. Um, just a uh, word of uh, warning that I have been to be aware of is that um, while you know, the method, I know the general rule is called the OE distinguish and distinctive interpretation, that you deal with from the top labs or chain labs, there's very, very, very added yeah. that they want to be able to separate everything based on method. As much as possible. Yeah. Whether it makes a difference in interpretation or not, yeah. that's how they aggregate data. Yep. So just be aware of people. Great, great point. So um, again, this comes down to um, the role of Link in creating different identifiers at the 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 test uh, name sort of level and other structures being available to communicate even more detail about that. And there's, there's kind of a balance, but there are other structures in HL7 messaging report where you can provide lots and lots of the gory stuff yeah. and they don't care, right? Uh, exactly. So there, there are sort of uh, operational rules that might force you to sort of use different uh, or business partner rules that might force you to kind of go in. Um, uh, in different directions with uh, with those methods, but some some people like them, and some people wish we didn't have any methods. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll close uh, I'll close with this. Um, so the and before we break for lunch, so the uh, the link term. So we talked about the different attributes. I want to mention that uh, link assigns sort of three uh, primary names to the terms that it creates. We've spent this time talking about the official uh, fully specified name, uh, but there are uh, two others, and I used um, Dr. J as an illustrative example of the different kinds of names people can have, just like the three official uh, link names. So um, 
Uh, we create the fully specified name. This is what we've been talking about. We also create a long common name, which is a little bit more um, sort of spelled out. Uh, it, uh, it uses um, uh, more typical parlance, but um, uh, can be sort of lengthy. And then we also create a short name where our target is uh, names less than 40 uh, characters. But what it's, uh, there, one important point is that Loink, uh, these three names are unique across all of Loink. That is, there's no Loink code uh, that has the same one of these three. And given local context, you might tolerate or want the same name for two different concepts by leaving out some of the information in, in the link name. But these names that we create, um, we want them to be sort of fully expressive and so they include the relevant parts uh, of the term name. So where would you use them? Well, um, we're gonna focus on using the fully specified name for mapping and that's kind of our, our, our golden ticket, our key to queuing in on what the right line code is. Um, typically when you load link into another system, I would say the, the, the better name, probably the best name to use for display is the long common name. Uh, but some systems can accommodate a long name uh, and so you need something shorter and that's where the short name can come into play. Um, for example, column headers or systems that have you know, pretty uh, small character limits where that long common name isn't gonna fit, you need something else and so the short name. Uh, the short name can fit, but these are what I would say are maybe the key primary uses. I mean, you can you can use whatever you want um, these names for, but these are probably what uh, people use the most for. 